I'm not a pro at this. <laughs> right, here we go again. Right, three, two, one. Hello, everyone. This is Ross at Teacher Talk at the most influential blog on education in the UK. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by FE teacher Fabian Daku. Fabian has recently blogged on Teacher Talk, although not for some time. And um, we hope to change that. Uh, Fabian is a uh, FE teacher working in the south of England. I'm going to ask Fabian to say hello and give us a little bit more context. Fabian, how are you? Oh, I'm good, thank you. Yeah, good evening, Ross. Yes. Yeah, so, good evening, um, and um, thanks for thanks for joining me. Um, tell listeners a little bit more about what you do. Okay, so I'm a further education teacher um, in the southeast of England. Um, I work at a place called West Hearts College uh, in Watford. And um, I've been in FE for, I'd say, probably nearing um, eight years or so now. Um, I've got some experience in secondary education, but FE is primarily uh, my area where I work now. Um, so um, I qualified as a teacher in 2008. And um, yeah, the time has absolutely whizzed by. Uh, so I've uh, probably had a split, um, as I was saying, in terms of uh, secondary education for half of my career. Mm -hmm. And then the second half um, has been further education. So uh, it's a number of roles that have been further education. So uh, primarily it's as a um, sports lecturer. So um, I teach on various courses um, such as uh, BTEC level two, level three, um, sports science. And uh, I'm also a teacher trainer. So I've uh, worked with different uh, potential and prospective teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something that I've started fairly recently. And uh, I'm also a teaching and learning leader within our college as well. So I try and uh, split myself up between <laughs> all three of those roles. So as you're, best a, as I can. you're a busy man. Is yes. what <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I, I haven't uh, at least done the teacher training still and the teaching and learning lead in formal, formal life. It is a real privilege to do that kind of work. How do you yeah. balance... I guess that imposter syndrome where you've mm. got to be at the cutting edge of all the stuff that's going on, filter that, share it with your staff, nurture other people's voices as well as just your own ideas. Yeah, yeah definitely. How do you balance it's, that? It's definitely something that, um, as you say, it's definitely a privilege. Um, the role of... Um, been working with a group of maybe 10 or so teachers in that cohort for teacher training. Um, so... If I'm honest with you, it's also myself learning from them because you almost put yourself in the position uh, that they were in. So at the start of my career, there were certain things that I wasn't too sure about. And mm -hmm. from listening to them, you hear about their worries, their concerns, their the things that they're confident about or not so confident about. And it's always good for me, really, to learn uh, different things because like everybody else, we've had the pandemic and I'm uh, coming to terms with uh, ed tech and how it is uh, playing a part in education now. So sometimes different members of staff will have different opinions and yeah, it's really good to, to kind of get um, my teacher training hat on and learn from them as well. So mm. for me, it's been a learning process uh, in, in that sense as well. Um, right, well, I'll come back to that. Um, give me a, a, a snapshot of life through COVID uh, at the college yeah. and where you're at now. Okay, so yeah, with um, the past... Uh, two or so years it's just been as I'm sure many of your guests have said before it's just been a time like no other we haven't experienced anything like this in terms of the uncertainties um, in terms of the unpredictability and just coming to terms with us having to get used to edtech at the moment so I remember quite clearly building and just finding out within the next week or so that there might be a closure so we quite quickly learned to use things like Microsoft Teams and mm -hmm. different um, different things. I think we were already on uh, the Canvas um, system, but then we hadn't really had much use of Microsoft Teams. So we just had to obviously adjust very quickly to that and mm -hmm. uh, get used to it on site. And then within a week or so, we were off site. And I think that was pretty much it for that academic year, for, I think from the March until the July that yeah, was us and really. uh, <laughs> what, what's the kind of mood or, or, or the landscape now for you? Yeah, I'd say it's a lot better in terms of all members of staff know how to use um, a lot of different programs such as Microsoft Teams. We we do feel more confident with it, um, and I feel the students are also a lot more confident with what they're doing. So 
we know how to the typical things like sending messages to groups and doing the um, lessons online, having things like breakout rooms within the classes as well to to make things as interactive as possible. So it's it's definitely been them getting used to it and and us adjusting to it as well and just making them understand that it's new for everybody and just to obviously bear with us and try and enjoy lessons at the same time. But it's um, it has been a yeah very difficult period for, for for most of us in terms of just just knowing our classes do we do we structure things the same way as we were previously in terms of the starter of the lesson and how to how to capture learning in the middle of the lesson so it's it's just knowing what works best and yeah. what i found is that just from being online you realize that the dynamic completely changes so whereas something will work in the classroom you'll have a a task in a group of four and then you'll get online and then it's yeah, hard to no get chance. a response from some <laughs> yeah <laughs> some absolutely and um it completely changes it so I'll, I'll i'll probably pop back to this conversation uh on, on this particular topic but i guess one last question before we move on is um one thing that really struck me when i moved away from my full-time job in a school to working mm -hmm. with teachers in all sorts of contexts was just the breadth and depth of what happens in colleges and i guess more importantly well, well not more importantly life as you know as a teacher on twitter there is often certain ideas that are more popular or certain ideologies that are promoted but once you move away from the bubble of social media and actually go into lots of different settings you realize that you know marking or whatever particular strategy might not work with four-year-olds or vulnerable <laughs> students in an fe college when they're studying hairdressing or a level yeah. two course that's right. Could you give people listening who might not be familiar with an FE setting, or at least since they last went to college, the the depth, the breadth, the range of subjects that a college like West Hearts provides? Mm, yeah, so you just list off a range of subjects, perhaps. Yeah, no. So it's uh, I think you've uh, you've mentioned some really good ones there. So we uh, do have a. Uh, things like health and beauty, um, we've got sports, um, the area that I work in, um, you've got um, typical departments like business, um, mm -hmm. so it's a massive school, um, business, they've got so many students and uh, her countless members of staff as well. Um, you've got, you do have the provision for GCSE, such as English and Maths, so uh, we mm -hmm. don't really do science retakes here mm -hmm. uh, in terms of GCSE, but Maths and English we do have a, a, a large number of students that are retaking their maths and English based on them not getting the results they needed or results they wanted the first time around. Um, we've got things like public services and science. Um, so people that want to join the, the police or the armed forces, there's courses for them to, to get into. And um, I think what West Arts College tend to do quite well is they just... We, we, we try and look at things like the career prospects and try and cater those courses based on what people want to do in, in real life. And uh, we share an office with the travel department as well. So right. they tend to have trips um, to certain places. I think it's been a bit tougher the past couple of years because of COVID. I know they did a, a, a trip fairly recently. They've, they've taken the students away and they've given them a real sense of what it feels like to be in the industry. Mm -hmm. And I think for me as a teacher, seeing things like that and going to places does make a massive difference to the students' learning and the students' engagement. So it's not always something that is possible in every school or every college, but I feel that the learners tend to get the most out of their experience when they are going out there and doing mm -hmm. things, it does make a massive difference to things like attendance as well. Sure. And, and I guess just on the note of, um, you know, teachers on Twitter like yourself, um, how do you translate some ideas that you think, right, might be popular, but how do you stitch them back into an FE setting and then disperse them under your teaching and learning lead as, you know, the, the teachers in your hairdressing department, hair and beauty, the social sciences, the engineering classes, the maths and English retakes, that's a challenge. I know that's a challenge. How, how do you tackle that? How do we do that? I think uh, the answer to that is probably with uh, with great difficulty. We're we're all still learning, and especially with the pandemic, it's it is very hard to to capture every single department and to capture the needs of every department and the needs of every learner. So we've got mm -hmm. you know, what we do in sport might be completely different to the music and uh, production department. So they 
will do things differently to us. And I've just been speaking to some department, uh, hair and beauty department today, and I've seen how they do their their tracking system is quite quite different to how we do ours. So I think the main thing is to is just us understanding that we all do things differently, and understanding and just respecting others ways of doing things because we've all got the same goal we've all got the mm -hmm. same end goal and uh, as long as the students progress is getting monitored and getting tracked um even though there's slight differences sure um, yeah and uh, you know give us a sense of how many uh, you know teachers support staff does the college have and how many students just gives a bit of context right uh, in terms of support staff um in terms of things like student well-being yeah, just general population of, yeah. you know, how many people work for the college, I suppose. Oh, wow. Oh, in terms of numbers, oof, I'd Pe say if you get a typical maybe secondary school, because the college, oof, because there's so many courses and we've got um, courses that will be a full-time course may might be on a Monday, Tuesday, Thursday. Yeah, part-time and virtual. That's so right, yeah. Have, so it's, it's are we talking hundreds? Yeah, I'd say it's, it's definitely the hundreds, yeah. So and any got, any um, numbers there for people population? How many students have you got, or is that hard to put, do you think? I'd say in the, in the thousands, even. <laughs> I don't know the exact number. Did, um, but... I guess if you did a teacher training day, yeah. how many people would be in the room if you did a whole staff day? A whole a whole staff day. Wow, that'd that be... that you would <laughs> might, might normally lead, like you know, you yeah. start of the year inset or end right. of year. What would you do? I don't think we've actually been able to do it as a whole staff because there's so many different staff. So um, sure, plus COVID's we... got in the way. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So um, the challenge is huge. I think mm. is what we're trying to explain. Um, yeah. Okay, let me uh, switch topics. So I want you to think back. Let's start off with when you were 16. Could you describe your 16-year-old self to listeners? Wow. Okay. So my 16-year-old self, I was somebody who was. Uh, fairly studious. Um, I've always had a love of things like English and sport. So at age 16, uh, as a lot of 16-year-olds uh, want to do, I wanted to become a professional football player. So I'd been quite um, privileged to have been scouted by a Premier League team at the time. And okay. uh, I'd been there. Can you name the team years. or you're not allowed? Uh, not sure. I'm not sure if I can name the team. It's not a very popular <laughs> team at the moment. <laughs> right. And they're still in the Premier League. <laughs> they're still in the Premier League. Okay. Yeah, they so owe a few pounds them. to somebody or perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's move on. Okay. So you were you were obviously in to get into your football as well as, yeah. you know, your school. So what happened? Yeah, so it's just uh, one of those situations where my body completely broke down. I was having so many knee injuries and back injuries and hamstrings and quad issues, just be mainly to do with how my body was aligned. It just wasn't quite working yeah. out. And I just thought, I'm not going to make it as a professional football player as much as I felt I would love to. And I felt I had a certain amount of talent, but my body just could not cope. So yeah. because of my love for sport, uh, that's when I discovered that things like uh, A-level sport was was available at the time, so I moved uh, quite s swiftly onto that and uh, mm -hmm. stayed on to study A-levels in sport and English and history and uh, general studies. And it's something that gave me the foundation to study sport at a higher level. To sure. agree and, and were you the kind of kid that got your homework in on time, or were you always <laughs> needing a reminder or two? Right, I would say the homework was probably in on time, but um, if quality. My, if my parents are listening to this, I have to be honest and say there's there was many occasions where I'd be up crazy hours of the of the, of the sure. morning doing. We've something. all been there. Yeah. Uh, what happened after A levels? Where, what happened next? Yeah, so I moved on to um, study sport and uh, leisure management at degree level at Br Brunel University. So um, I did that over a three year period. Yeah, and then. Uh, I decided to stay um, in sport in terms of studying sport, and I did a two-year uh, master's in sport and culture. So um, I just wanted to continue with that love of sport, and yeah. I was more of the the essay writing type, and I was into the sociology and the different theories. And I think that that two years studying the MA was was a real eye opener, and mm -hmm. I took it really seriously, and yeah, did my best on the course, obviously, and. Um, yeah, I just saw it as a, a quite a big. So where um, where did the the teacher conversation happen? <laughs> who who was it? When did it happen? Yeah, so after um, I think while I was studying that particular masters, I was working uh, part time in retail. 
So what happened is from studying part, um, from working part time in retail, I moved on to full time. They offered me some management opportunities, and I did that for a few years, and well, maybe five years or so. And I think it, I just got to a time when I loved the people I worked with, fantastic team of staff, but I just realised that there was there was more that I felt I, I could do in terms of education. So I think it was actually a conversation with, with my mum on one of the weekends, and I think she just said, "What well, you know? Would, would you like to become a teacher? Have you ever thought about that before?" And it just popped up. I was probably caught in the whirlwind of, of retail, and yeah. I started to look it up, and I realised there was something called uh, the TDA. Uh, I think it's yeah. called Te Teaching and Development Agency Teaching or Development Training Agency. Development yeah. Agency. Yeah. And uh, they were running taster days um, in secondary school. So um, I just wrote off to them or contacted them through the website. And then um, they found me a school um, to, to go in for the day. And funnily enough, when I went in for the taster day, um, I really enjoyed it. And I felt I could feel that it was, it was definitely my passion. And um, they had some roles available as a cover supervisor. So... Mm -hmm. Um, they were impressed with what they saw on that particular day and I was impressed with them and I just put the application in and yeah, was uh, you know, lucky enough to get So there you go, the rest is history. So yeah, I'm assuming so, that was about 2006, 2007? Uh, that was yeah, 2007, seven eight. I think that was. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. it's a, it's a cover and then uh, you said you started in secondary uh, and then yeah. you did the switch. That's right. So um, started off... Um, after the that particular role, um, they had some GTP roles available. So it was on the graduate teacher program. So mm -hmm. for anyone that's not aware of the um, the GTP, they GTP, they yeah. place you in a school for a year. You train on the job um, in the industry that you obviously choose. So for for myself, it was in the PE department. Mm -hmm. um, I worked with them. Yeah, had a really really good mentor at the time. Uh, and we had, well, I had an external person that would come and do my assessments every term and do the observations and, and uh, yeah, just pick some some really interesting points in terms of picking my practice apart. So it's, uh, yeah, really good. And, uh, uh, could I put you in the corner? What, what would you say are the kind of pros and cons of secondary versus FE or if there are any? And, uh, you know, right. what have you liked or disliked about both? It's... Uh, Talking to my current students about the other day, I said, um, do they find it strange that they address us by first name in FE? Because here I'm known as Fabian, um, but uh, in uh, secondary education, I was known as Mr. Darku. So it does have a strange feel to it. And um, yeah. I think because I was in secondary first, I was always known as Mr. Darku. And then I go to I went into further education. It was you know Fabian. Yeah, it's for some it's quite a difficult thing to adjust to, and you think, do they respect you as much because they're using your first name, and does it make a difference, or does it make them feel more comfortable with, with you as a as, as a person guiding their learning? And I'm still not sure at the moment. I think some students adjust really well to it, and maybe in FE, I think some maybe not quite at the peak of their maturity and still maturing. So I feel maybe for some it's still better to have the the more formal route. Yeah, no, it's an in, it's an interesting question right there, isn't it? Uh, uh, what difference does it make to outcomes? Uh, yeah. I suppose is a good research question. Right, let me switch topics again. Let's. I, I want to talk. To, uh, you're a black man. I want to uh, uh, raise the profile of racism, diversity in education. Um, you know, my career was always in London. You know, secondary schools and surrounded by, uh, uh, you know, not an extortionate diverse teaching team but in some schools more than others but uh, particularly at leadership level often mm. the white man leadership table white woman at, uh, and rarely diversity right at the top um what are your thoughts on you know diversity in education if we narrow it down to diversity in fe sector and, and maybe where you work and your general thoughts mm. i know those are big questions yeah, but let me just um, let me just get get some of your immediate thoughts on mm. the challenges and some of the things that we can do. Yeah, I think it's it's something that has obviously come more to to the forefront of of the media and education in the past few years. We've had um, issues with uh, George Floyd, and I did hear one of your previous guests speaking on on the issue uh, not so long ago. And I feel, in terms of diversity, um, mm. it is something that is it's absolutely crucial in terms of moving forward and progression and being 
just recognising that we are all different. And I think it's not just necessarily me as a, as a black male or I just think every type of, of um, element of, of diversity needs to be recognised. So in terms of ability, disability, and I feel we need to have everybody's voice heard. Mm -hmm. So I feel it is it is really important to, to get everybody at the, t at the table to have these conversations on, on issues of race and diversity and inclusion and equity. I think it, it, the more issues and the more... The, the, the more we have a range of people sitting at the table having these discussions, it does. Mm. I guess the, the question the is always the, the nature of them, the role model, isn't there? And mm. I, I guess I've got a two part question. Who is your role model? And, and do you kind of see a pathway where being the school leader is a possibility for someone in your shoes? Well, I mean, in terms of role model, I wouldn't say, I think grow. it's more of a question that, uh, I was probably better at answering as a kid. I think I'd, I used to get asked that question a lot as a kid, and I say, right, John Barnes, football player. Yeah, is my I guess role my point is: have, is there a role model for you within education? And uh, mm. I, I fear that it's going to be quite, um, you know, at least from a diversity perspective, mm. you know, a, a black male school leader. Although yeah. there are some, we know the the numbers mm. are uh, in terms of proportion to the number of people from diverse backgrounds, uh, yeah. the, the numbers don't stack up. So mm -hmm. I guess that two-part question, uh, more of a difficult question, I'm not expecting a necessary an answer, but have you got a role model within education? I and would say, hmm. Are, is that pathway that something, whether you want to be mm. a, a, the leader of the college or not, but d mm. do you think as a black man with all the kind of s potential system issues against you, that is, you know, and these are big questions, Fabian. So, you know, something I'd like to maybe discuss uh, in a future conversation with you. But I guess it's, you know, just unpicking these difficulties that we have across our society. But yeah. I think we also need to discuss them within our education system because the, yeah, they are yeah. prevalent too. Yeah, no, I do agree with you. And I think with what you asked me about the role model question, I've got, I've got different role models within education. I would say. Um, I wouldn't necessarily uh, pinpoint one person as a role model because they're they're black as I am, but I would mm -hmm. definitely say there's different people that I look to in in different ways, and I'd say um, they're, they're role models to me. I'd definitely mm -hmm. say um, somebody like uh, Ronaldo Lawrence, who's uh, one of your previous yeah yeah, I know Ronaldo. He's yeah, on our he's, podcast. Um, so he's a yeah, he's a gem. Right. He's fantastic in terms of ed tech, and he is, he's, yeah. he's very motivational. So in terms of role models in education, he's definitely someone I look up to and. Uh, someone like Alison and he offers Curry, lovely right? little video shorts every mm. every other day. Yeah, doesn't he? fantastic <laughs> yeah. like that. <laughs> yeah. So and what about a... pathways mm. and opportunities? Um, you know, maybe not just in your college, without you know limiting it. But mm. do you see that um, you know potential future leaders like yourself have a clear ladder of opportunity within education, it or should the DfE mm. do more? Yeah, I would say um, the main starting point for for myself as a black male, or um, I would say that you you have to make yourself open to to starting with yourself and bettering yourself. I could um, maybe think of certain things that might have happened in my career or in my life, and I could be quite bitter about those things. But yeah. what I try and do is a more positive thing these days. Is that I look at every single area of weakness that I think I might have. Mm -hmm. whether it's to do, to do with um, my uh, knowledge or whether it's, whether it's to do with ed tech or whether it's to do with, um, you know, ways that I might conduct myself in my practice. I start with those elements first and I always try and make myself open as an educator. I try and um, speak to everybody. I try and learn from every single department that I can. And I just try and not look too much at the issue of race, even though it is a key issue and it is, has been a key barrier for many people like myself i definitely say that looking forward to the positive and pushing yourself mm -hmm. forward and uh filling any gaps that you feel you've got in terms of your um, career progression um, and your training mm -hmm. uh is something that can be a good starting point to, to help yourself to get noticed as well and mm -hmm. um, me personally i'd say i'm one of those people that is more into 
the teaching and learning side of things. I love learning about ed tech. It's not necessarily that I would want to go into the leadership of, of the college or um, be a head teacher of a school. It's something that I'm you know undecided about, but I know at the moment my passion is to um, maybe excel in something like what I'm doing, all the roles I've got to, to try and bring the next generation of teachers through and mm -hmm. just make a real difference with ed tech in the classroom. Sure. So, any so I guess on that note, you know, observing <clears throat> our interactions on social media and that you're listening to radio shows and blogs and all sorts, give mm -hmm. give people a sense of the the information you're soaking up as a CPD leader mm -hmm. and how you filter this. Because I know that I profited as a CPD lead being given the time and the remit to gather this information and I benefited from it. Mm. The, the challenge is making sure other people do. Yeah. So a uh, two-part question, where do you go to for all your sources and how do you balance all that? And mm. how then do you filter the right things back through to your staff? Right, I think um, I'm someone that uh, the library staff uh, in our college seem to know me quite well. I'm always uh, in the library. I'm a bit of a, a geek in that way. So funnily enough, it was um, one of your books uh, that I picked up a few years ago. Well, you're definitely the not a geek. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with being geek. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's the um, the Teacher Toolkit book. And um, yeah, yeah it's, uh, I've learned a lot from, from books like that because it, it, it breaks things down. And one thing I liked about uh, reading uh, a lot of your books is that you're very honest. So you don't say things like what we need to do to become perfect teachers, you actually flip it the other way around and say there isn't really a perfect teacher. Yeah, and, look you at know, all we these mistakes. Mark, <laughs> yeah, we can't mark every single piece of work that we no. intend to. And you've admitted on... Uh, I, I admitted once books. I paid my sister-in-law to mark my exam papers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know, so it's, it's us admitting it's a that. waste of money mm. and time because I had to go and double check her work because she'd made one or two mistakes. We're still laughing about that now. Good 20 years yeah. ago. No, um, so okay, and so like then that. how do you, um, you know, and I know you listen to all the radio shows yeah. uh, as well. Um, so then how do you filter this uh, mm. into, you know, material that you share with colleagues? Yeah, so funnily enough, it's um, it is just through things like Twitter, right? I've... <laughs> I would say it's something that I, I used towards the latter part of my career. I haven't, I didn't really use it when I was in secondary education. Um, although I know of many in secondary and primary that are on Twitter and they, they're on the whole edu, edu Twitter thing and they yeah. share knowledge. And I would say myself, I, I look for a lot of things uh, through educational um, sources on Twitter, and I just tend to share those through tweets really. So I just. Uh, we'll see something uh, on Twitter or I'll listen to um, the teacher's radio station, um, such as Teacher Hug Radio, and then I'll I'll listen to a show. And then I'll, it's almost like it is CPD to me, really. And it is something that I've been thinking about quite a lot in terms of things like that are not recognised as official sources of CPD no. or it's not recognised as things that are, you know, direct influences on our, our appraisals as teachers but I would say and I know the um, radio stations will you know attest to this I'm I'm someone that I'm someone that can just listen to these stations for hours and hours and learn different things and engage in the conversations uh, no matter mm. what they're about behavior management or ed tech or yeah. representation and I would say the past year in particular from listening to um, teachers radio I've definitely probably learnt more CPD in terms of any time in my whole career, just from that as... So there you go, resource. big up to yeah. Teacher Hug Radio. Mm. Yeah, um, so definitely, definitely has impacted me positively. Now, I want to I want to mention this terrible world, word called marking. Uh, <laughs> we know that it drives teachers crazy in all sorts of settings. I'll yeah. stick my neck out and say in FE settings too, but maybe set the record straight. Is that true or, or not true from your perspective? Ooh, I would say... I'd even argue it's more the case in FE as well, because sometimes we do have the larger groups of students. Always a large group, but we might have, well, similar to secondary schools, up to 30, up 30 students in a class. Mm -hmm. And the assignments are very, very detailed and very, they're very long. So we might have uh, one particular piece of coursework for the students, and it might be 70 slides on a PowerPoint, and us having to go through that 
and uh, read each of the slides and um, put comments on, on the relevant sections. It can be something that if it's done in the way it's maybe expected to be done, it could take mm -hmm. all day really to mark one group. So how work. does someone, uh, you know, a teaching and learning leader in your college context, how do you approach your marking policy? Do you allow the individual departments to have their own method or is, that, is there a whole school, whole college policy? Uh, there is a whole college policy in terms of uh, the marking that needs to be done and then normally we'll have the verification procedure so we'll have the SV so quite similar to What's SV? I need to check for That's abbreviation. The standard verification. So. Right, okay, just for listeners <laughs> and for my own benefit. <laughs> yeah. So we'll have the, the same type of procedures that, um, that exist as well. Uh, so you might have a group of 20 learners and then maybe uh, five pieces of work might need to be sent off for um, external verification where mm -hmm. um, an external body will look at the pieces of work and doing or well, conducting our courses in the way they should be. So it is quite similar to, to secondary in that sense. Yeah, I, mean, I was familiar with the term IVs. So mm. I thought, um, yeah. OK, so marking um, drives teachers crazy in all types of <laughs> contexts. I guess... Uh, uh, the next, the kind of f final question on this particular theme is, in your role, you know, CPD, uh, I don't know if you're doing observations across different areas too, but, you know, what, what are your insights from, you know, walking around the college? Uh, in terms of marking? Oh, well, marking, general classroom observations, how mm. you widen your own lens yeah. from being a sports teacher, popping into mm. hairdressing and beauty to engineering, yeah. and then seeing how you do something in one subject. This is mm -hmm. a, a, a real uh, insight I've learned from my travels is as a design and technology teacher, when I go and talk about X, Y strategy, it won't work with a year one pupil in a drama <laughs> lesson. Yeah. Um, so you suddenly realize the, the world of education cannot have one method. It requires right. many, many different ways of doing something. Um, I guess just mm. uh, just unpicking your insights and your experiences yeah. on a range yeah. of different topics, marking and feedback and observations. What what is the kind of things that you see in your role? Right. So I would definitely say I am someone that likes to walk up and down the floor. So it's a in our building at the college, and I tend to. I, I walk around anyway in terms of uh, just stretching my legs and for, for well-being as well. I don't like to be cooped up in the same office all day. So mm -hmm. just from walking around the corridors, I'll see different things that will go on. And from doing the, the famous magpie, and they call it, I'll, I'll look through, you know, one particular window and I'll see something. And I'm, I would definitely say I'm the type of teacher that doesn't mind speaking to other departments and I'll... I might see that same teacher in the corridor and I'll say, oh, I saw something really good in your lesson. Um, mm -hmm. What was it? Um, I saw something on a particular PowerPoint and then we'll just share good practice that way. So definitely from walking up and down the corridors, I, I tend to pick up a lot of ideas on on ways to ways to conduct lessons, different tools to use, different methods of getting students engaged in a particular lesson. Uh, some people get the students to work in pairs Others will work in the islands and the groups. So, yeah, I think it's it's something that we just need to maybe open ourselves up a bit more in terms of not be so closed off in terms of our own departments and just not be afraid to to just venture out, really. And I'm, I'm quite mm -hmm. lucky because uh, some of my lessons are in different areas of the college. So uh, I might be um, inside, um, I, I might be within the department and it's it's next door to where my lessons taking place mm -hmm. so it's quite um easy for me to speak to the members of staff there and to yeah to pick their brains on particular ideas as well yeah so uh, sharing is caring isn't it um yeah, definitely <laughs> I, I, I guess what what advice then would you give to maybe another teacher in your college who's not got your role who's you know, let, let's say maybe 90% committed to a teaching timetable and has very limited time to walk around uh, mm. the college, maybe also not bothered about looking on Twitter or listening to a radio. Mm. How, how would you, as a CPD leader, dress someone who needs a bit of help, needs mm. a bit of inspiration, but yeah. doesn't have the time or inclination yeah. to go and find something? 
Yeah, it's uh, more to do with setting up regular meetings. Uh, so it's uh, just touches on another area that I'm quite big on as well. So the whole idea of reflection and reflective practice. So um, anyone listening, they may or may not have heard of the uh, rate um, reflection that I tend to use. Um, so I have spread that quite widely across um, some of the blogs I've produced mm -hmm. um, for um, different sites. But the rate um, stands for um, reflect. Uh, so I'll look at a lesson and I'll just reflect on what's went well um, or just different things that have happened in that particular lesson. Uh, then I'll look at the achievements. So what achievements have the learners made or mm -hmm. what achievements has the teacher made to facilitate the learning? And then I'll look at the things that haven't gone so well and I'll look at addressing targets. So the T is uh, target setting. Yeah. And then uh, the E is probably the most important, knowing how to enforce and evaluate those targets. So I use it for myself. I've used it over a number of years now, just uh, in thinking about things that happen in the classroom on a day-to-day -day basis. And even if I don't always write it down um, in terms of a log, I'll always think in my head, right, what, what, what happened in the particular lesson there? What was what was good? What Why didn't that particular theory yeah, work no, out? It's a, great little, uh, it's a great little methodology and the acronym mm -hmm. rate is a really, uh, great method for, uh, I guess, making that memorable. Like you said, mm -hmm. you've used it for years. Yeah. Uh, so I've written those down. Re really good uh, top tip there. Now we're recording this video and audio, so there'll be podcast listeners listen to this who can't see us. Uh, but you're, uh, I'm, I'm going to throw loads of quick fire questions at you, Fabian. So you can't pause or hesitate. I'm going to see if I can catch you off guard. <laughs> but uh, for people listening, you're you're dressed very smart. Do you always dress that <laughs> smart for work? <laughs> Right, funnily enough, I was dressed in my sports gear earlier and um, just did a quick change. I thought I'll... Uh, I'm just going to say the smart smartest PE teacher in the world. <laughs> what, do you, what do you wear in a dress down Friday? Uh, funnily enough, we don't have dress down Fridays. Yeah, I'm always <laughs> in my tracksuit. All right, in your wildest thing. dreams, if you had a dress down Friday, what would you go to work in? Um, dress down Friday, wow. Um, it'd probably just be some kind of... Um, t-shirt and jeans and smart shoes okay. I, I don't really nice dress that <laughs> okay next question what's on your desk what are you working on oh in terms of work or yeah work please work wow. focused and um, what what's your next big to-do list okay big to-do list i would say it's <laughs> working on some of the targets as part of the the rate uh, for maybe one of the groups i'm working with at the moment just trying to improve sure. practice in in areas that they need to improve as individuals. Okay, thank you. Uh, what book are you reading at the moment? Um, I have picked up one that's from yourself recently, 60 Second uh, oh, 60 CPD. Second CPD. Yeah, uh, I think you could be my number one fan. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> um, what would be your piece of advice for a secondary teacher considering moving to FE? Ooh, I would say that they need to uh, understand that there is a a big difference in terms of people age 16 plus not always knowing exactly what they want to do as their long-term career even mm -hmm. though at 16 we're led to believe that we should know what you want to do at that age it's uh, yeah believe yeah, it or not it takes a lot of convincing <laughs> uh, so on that note what was what was your 16 year old career the footballer or was it something else um yes it was yes yeah, right okay well, easy one yeah. there right okay um uh finish this sentence if i was education secretary of state i would I would ensure that CPD um, is more far reaching in terms of teachers, radio stations, in terms of uh, content on uh, sites like Twitter, um, just to capture the full range of, of conversations and cooperation and collaboration that takes place on things like EdTech. Um, on yeah, I, I, I'll follow up on that question. If there was a way of recording all the extra CPD that we do for ourselves on Twitter, for example, or the radio, what would be your brainchild idea for recording that? What What would you suggest? It has to be something that is modern. Um, I would say tracking tracking something like that can be quite tricky because how how do we know exactly what constitutes CPD? We could. You could say having a conversation with somebody CPD, but yeah, they could be listening knowing... to this rubbish podcast and thinking, <laughs> right, that's an hour of my CPD for appraisal. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, 
There's so it's many, a tough one, isn't it? Mm, it is a tough one. It's like knowing where to where to start the start. And right. Well, let's revisit that, and we'll come up with a a, a million pound uh, inventions <laughs> scheme. Um, now, footballer aside, teaching aside, what, what what's your next dream job if you uh, had that abstract off the wall choice? What would you want to be? Ooh, I would say the type of job I'm looking at is probably something that hasn't even been created yet. You will sometimes hear of. Um, uh, we speak to our students and we'll say that you're we're training you for jobs that don't exist yet and I'd probably say it's something similar to myself really I'm, okay. I'm trying to venture out into so many different things like video production for sure. some of the uh, acronyms I'm creating and give um, me three words mm. that your students would use to describe you and your teaching Ooh. I would say um, committed uh, honest mm-hmm and that's oh, two words hard working <laughs> maybe persistent sometimes they feel okay. like they really we'll give, give up that. <laughs> um <laughs> if we had 24 hours in watford where would we go what would we see what would we do you would have to come to west hearts college see uh, some of the good practice that's taking place and uh yeah hopefully catch up for a tea or coffee <laughs> and uh, another question if we uh, had a 48 hours in in, in accra the capital of ghana what, what, <laughs> where would you take me for a, a bit of a good cultural experience Fabian? well it would have to be somewhere where there's good food so many places i can't pinpoint one particular place yeah but, uh somewhere where you've got good um kebabs i'm a lover of meat at the moment maybe one day i'll go um vegan but at the moment i tend to like uh, the kebabs <laughs> yeah really good. excellent um, <laughs> who would you recommend i interview next and why Ooh, some of the people <laughs> you've actually interviewed them already i was mentioning ronaldo lawrence uh, but i'd definitely say um there's someone that i uh nazi Hade Londres. that's okay. her twitter um handle um not sure if that's her, her full name uh, sometimes people switch their names around but yeah she is really good at the whole ed tech thing and i saw sure. um, right we'll have to send yeah. me your details and we'll, we'll hopefully mm. connect um now you said you worked in retail earlier what's your top tip for me getting a bargain <laughs> uh the top tip would be to speak to people that work in retail to find out when the sales are <laughs> starting and they can tell you what's going in the sale what's not going in the sale and then you can queue up you know 6 a.m <laughs> before uh, the main customers get there sure um I'll I'll, uh, I'll I'll use that, and we're always wanting a bargain, especially with all the energy prices today. We're we're all looking for ways to save a few pounds here or there, aren't we? <laughs> um, okay, uh, where can listeners find out more about you? You know, books, websites, Twitter handles. Okay, so um, at the moment, I I think more for well being. I do things like uh, producing the blog. So I blog for um, Nexus Education. Uh, so I've been yeah, very blessed to receive a second uh, national award nomination, second year in a row for wow, a blog that I wrote, which was on the pandemic. Um, I also write for Rise magazine, um, a new um, teaching magazine uh, started by Kat uh, Couchy, amongst others as well. Yeah. Um, and uh, I've also blogged for yourself. Uh, you have. Talk and hopefully we'll get you back so, on soon. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. For that. So no, I'd love to um, get back involved with uh, the blogs for Teacher Toolkit. I've um, produced some on things like teacher confidence, uh, reward systems, uh, role models. Uh, for yeah. The teacher Toolkit. Oh, well, sites. Well, 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 when we get, get back up to speed, we'll have you back on for sure. <laughs> um, I forgot to ask, what position uh, on the football field? It was a striker, yes. Yeah. So I was uh, trying to bang the goals in. And, uh... Left foot or right foot? Which one's more dominant? Oh, I was uh, predominantly right-footed, but um, I remember at the age of 12, our coach uh, pulling us off to one side saying, right, we all have to learn to use our left foot. So we spent an hour <laughs> <laughs> all just well, kicking left, left foot. So I had to do the opposite, learn on my right. Um, right, what, I've got one more obscure question, I guess, just for the current state of affairs. But mm. what's your take on uh, Chris, um, Chris Stock and Will Smith? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, funnily enough, because I've got my head uh, in the books most of the time and just uh, I'm a parent of two and yeah. a husband is quite a busy time. I didn't actually know about the incident until I got into work. I think it was yesterday. And yeah. one of my colleagues said, oh, have a look at this. Have you heard about it? Yeah. Uh, Will Smith and Chris Rock, funny enough, are two people I've always looked up to. I've, you know, purchased um, yeah, the DVDs and things like that over the years. I was... I was surprised to see that it happened, but 
I was saying to some of my colleagues that everybody has their breaking point, and I think for Will Smith, that just was his. Uh, yeah, I, I shared with my wife, point. I thought he's definitely suffering, uh, he's mm -hmm. definitely having a moment, and, and it yeah. erupted there, and I think Chris Rock just obviously touched the nerve but um yeah, yeah 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 it's a tricky one isn't it it's a tricky mm. one okay my last big question uh, what would you hope for uh, what would you hope to be your legacy i just want people to remember me for someone that cared about the students education and their welfare and their well-being so um i'm not necessarily someone that is um, even though everybody wants to progress in life and in their careers i'm definitely someone that's always put the students at the forefront of what I'm trying to do. And then once you realize that you do that, everything else often will fall into place really, because it's the, the backbone of everything. Um, we work in education. So the, the key thing has to be our learners. So mm -hmm. I have had some really nice comments from ex students over the years. And they've said, you know, things like I'm, I'm doing my master's degree. And I remember when I was at college and Fabian helped me a lot to find a university place. I hear from quite a few students saying positive things. So it does, it is one of those um, intangible things really as as teachers and educators, we realize that we can't always measure the impact we have directly, but we always will have, hopefully, <laughs> a special place in the heart of the people we teach and it can last forever. And um, yeah, it's just amazing how quickly time goes. It's, it doesn't feel like 20 years ago since I was at uni and time just flies and if you, you'll always remember your teachers and yeah I always remember my fantastic teachers that I had and you remember the great ones you remember the not so great ones and you just yeah. learn from everyone. So there you go and it was your mum to thank for getting you into teaching wasn't it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you don't look a day over 20 Fabian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah can I maybe double that. <laughs> I'll take so that uh, thank, you. thank you Fabian so there you go folks um, award winning sports football kicking um, you know, sports science, teaching and learning lead, uh, Mr. Oh, Enthusiastic. Award nominated. Mark, Mark <laughs> dressed, uh, brilliant Fabian Darkie. Fabian, thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you for the invite, Ross. Really appreciate it. And, yeah, it's uh, been great to connect with you properly. And uh, I can't wait to see you getting blogging on the site again soon. Thanks for your time. All no the best. Problem. Thank you so much, Ross. All right. Bye, bye for bye. now.